Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Denise Stolyarov, Associate Curator at Pushkin House. Thank you for coming, joining us this afternoon, um, either in person or online. We have quite a few people watching us on YouTube, so thank you for doing that. Uh, and I'm really happy to have three distinguished speakers here, uh, and I'm going to introduce our moderator, Maria, uh, and then pass the microphone to her so that she could uh, introduce Macaulay and Susan properly. Uh, so, Maria, Dr. Maria Chichanatsky is a lecturer at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, she received a PhD in philosophy from the Center Re for Research in Modern European Philosophy at Kingston University. And uh, we are uh, eagerly expecting her forthcoming book entitled Alexander Bogdanov and the Politics of Knowledge after the October Revolution, which will be published this year in December by Palgraf Macmillan. And I hope we'll have a chance to organize a book launch at Pushkin House. But now, Maria, uh, the word is yours. The floor. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Th thank you so much. Um, and I am very excited to <laughs> introduce uh, two speakers who really will have a conversation and I'm going to moderate and gesture towards some questions. And at the end, we, you all have a chance also to ask uh, questions and participate in uh, this uh, conversation. Um, Denise mentioned that uh, my, book, my forthcoming book on Bogdanov um, uh, but I just wanted to also mention that, of course, today's conversation will gravitate towards the question of epistemology and politics, and I think that's a canon and um, deconstruction of the canon, and um, uh, that is something that I'm also invested some time into thinking through in my work. But let me introduce... Um, Mikola Ridney, uh, who is an artist and filmmaker and curator. He studied at the National Academy of Design and Art in Kharkiv, uh, Ukraine, um, and was also actively involved in different artistic collectives and artist-run uh, spaces. Um, he is known for many interesting projects and works. I will just name few. The recent one curatorial project, Armed and Dangerous, 2017-2021, um, um, and this was a basis for him to establish a platform for um, independent Ukrainian filmmakers. Uh, then in 2022-23, he curated a number of uh, film uh, screenings and festivals uh, that have been shown across uh, Europe and also it's been shown here in 2022. I'm not going to list all of them, but uh, his work is also has been exhibited in many exhibitions, including Mo Museum of Contemporary Art in Arlington and Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw. 
Um, and now he is a um, fellow at the Berlin Senate Department for Culture and Europe's Artistic uh, Research uh, Grant Program. Is that relevant? Yeah, that's relevant. Okay. <laughs> Which is about to finish, but something you like a uh, teaching uh, a professorship at, at Ac Academy in Berlin. Yeah. That is upcoming. Um, that, that was a very long introduction. We are going to discuss um, Mikola's uh, most recent work, which you hopefully saw just prior to this talk or yesterday. And I'm also going to introduce Professor Suzanne uh, Stratling, uh, who is a professor of Eastern European Studies at Freie Universität in Berlin. And she teaches a contemporary, or oh, sorry, comparative literature and contemporary literature as well, <laughs> I imagine, uh, with a special focus on East European uh, literatures. And her research spans from Baroque aesthetics to contemporary media with a focus on the poetics of uh, Russian avant-garde. And her latest book is The Hand at Work, The Poetics of Poesis in the Russian Avant-Garde from 2021. Okay, um, that's, that's good uh, setting for, for, for us to start. And um, I'm very curious to start uh, discussing uh, this project, which has many layers of collaborations. So it is a collaboration between you two, um, and that's already in itself uh, a very curious situation. An artist uh, who collaborates uh, with a scholar of uh, literature and theory, and how would that um, go, and how would you read uh, two classical texts uh, by Pushkin and Byron and translate them you know, into this uh, exciting um, artistic project. So, yeah, I would just want to start with that, if you can talk us through how it came about and what was it personally for you. Maybe start, uh, I want to start with Susan first, how on, on that. Now? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I joined this project at a rather late, late stage Face, so I guess uh, maybe uh, Mikola might have started. But when Mikola contact, contacted me in, I believe it was in May um, this year, um, with a suggestion to to conduct a workshop with rappers on um, Byron and Pushkin, um, he kind of caught me in the middle of the class that I was teaching at that time on culture and violence. It was a class that. Um, attempted to challenge, I guess, the entire notion that the process of civilization is necessarily a process of uh, sublimation, um, that culture and violence are kind of uh, opposing entities. And while this class, um, we were doing a rather broad general philosophical overview, but it had a very concrete and acute impulse. Um, and that was a... Uh, um, a statement by Aksana Zabushko from the previous year where uh, Aksana Zabushko claimed that Russian literature is not an innocent bystander uh, to the invasion and to this war, but um, that it kind of prepared uh, Russia and also the West um, for the cruelties that they, that they were going on. Um, um, this um, statement by uh, Zabushko caused an outcry in German, in the German public. And immediately kind of uh, scholars rushed to defend Russian literature. Um, most uh, prominently, maybe you heard the statement from the German pen club representative who said, our enemy is Putin, not Pushkin. And I guess this, our enemy is Putin, not Pushkin, um, um, yeah. <laughs> is rather significant for this uh, project. Um, and it also ve it's also very obvious that this claim um, is neglecting very important facts. First of all, that there is a um, cultural front of this war as well. 
And that literature is also not only t now, but has previously been used as a soft weapon, so to speak, to expand the, the Ruski Mir. And also that, the, that um, art and aggression entertain a very complicated relationship. And it seems to me that Mikola's work um, revolves around this relationship between art and aggression and how art can reflect on aggression and violence and offer a space to refract this violence without merely representing it or, or repeating it. And this is, I, I'm sorry, I'm answering very long. We have only 45 minutes. Um, yeah, but, but this is um, why um, I felt not only honored by um, Mikola's suggestion to conduct this workshop, but also very intrigued because it, I felt there was a, maybe not an overlap, a lap, but there was a shared interest in, 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 this, in this topic. Yeah, maybe you want to add something on the collaborative process and then immediately um, to comment on the choice of the two works and probably to, yeah, how, how would you work with that two texts and how they've been perceived by your collaborators at the workshop and what was your initial idea and how it transformed probably towards, you know, the, in the process of your doing. So as far as I understand, you, you did a workshop, or you invited the actors, the rappers themselves who've been part of it and you collectively discussed um, uh, two poems, um, slowly reading them and, and then it was a process of translating those, uh, some, some of the, lines or episodes in, 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 in the poems uh, to, uh, to this piece, uh, which, which is um, uh, rapping or rap battle piece. So if you can talk us through how, <laughs> I don't know, it's a complicated question, but uh, through collaboration, how you attempted to address uh, this question of canon and cultural violence or the violence of culture, um, as, as I don't know, what would you prefer best to identify it in which uh, terms? That sounds already like a few questions, but <laughs> okay, I will start uh, um, uh, from the beginning. Um, I started my research on uh, uh, Mazepa um, <coughs> around two years ago. Uh, the reason why, because um <coughs> I found this figure <coughs> of Ukrainian hetman, meaning uh, political and military leader of Ukrainian Cossacks uh, in 1719 um, uh, century. Um, uh, very, um, very important also in the face of uh, ongoing war uh, of Russia against Ukraine. Because uh, Mazepa was used by um, mm, by Russian propaganda, but also uh, which was uh, repeating the official uh, mm, uh, historiography in Russia. Whereas Mazepa was iconic figure of a traitor uh, to the empire mm, and Russian Tsar. Whereas um, in the Ukrainian historiography, um, he's a national hero and um, and a freedom fighter. Um, and um, the reason why, because uh, um, at that time when he was active, uh, Ukraine wasn't a state yet, uh, but... Uh, we can speak about Cossack's protostate um, of the time and in the search for possibilities um, to have uh, independence and sovereignty uh, Mazepa was need to um, often to switch um, uh, sides um, and uh, the reason why uh, he's seen as a traitor um, in Russia because um, in a crucial moment of uh, northern war uh, between uh, 
Russia and Sweden, uh, Mazepa and Ukrainian Cossacks who were affiliated to the Russian army uh, switched the side uh, to, uh, to the Swedish one. Um, the reason for that was also uh, that um, the Cossacks' autonomy uh, previously granted um, from the side of Moscow um, was reduced more, more and more by uh, Russian Tsar Peter, Peter I. Um, so I think it's um, <coughs> not really correct uh, uh, to call this um, a treason, uh, but uh, rather a political choice. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, when I start to um, look at the um, culture trace of Mazepa, not only political and historical, uh, I found these two poems um, and uh, one is by Pushkin and uh, another one by uh, Byron and uh, both of them had um, <coughs> uh, both of them left uh, a big uh, trace um, the Byron's poem in the international culture because after him um, uh, lots of um, the French painters of romanticism era uh, painted uh, painted uh, Mazepa uh, in the same uh, manner how he's shown in um, in Byron's piece um, as a naked man tied uh, to the horse. But then this image um, and the plot was um, transformed into, into a theater uh, place um, and after that even to um, show business and um, entertaining show uh, in the US. Uh, at the same time, uh, um, the Pushkin's plot um, had a big influence uh, to the Russian culture, so after Pushkin, uh, Tchaikovsky wrote uh, the opera Mazepa repeating uh, uh, the same story after him then um, when uh, silent cinema and first film experiments appeared uh, there was um, the, the film made in Russian Empire <coughs> titled in the same way uh, Mazepa. Um, but uh, obviously these two poems, um, so it's not only the conflict and tension in history and politics, but it's also uh, tension in culture and between different um, uh, artistic visions uh, on uh, Mazepa and who he was, what what role he played, but also uh, uh, up different approaches how to talk about him and how to show him. Um, but at the same time, um, it was not so easy to uh, to build the structure for the performance based on this conflict, because uh, these two texts, uh, they're very different. They're written in a very different manner, while... Uh, um, so it's not only uh, the conflict on the level of uh, the story, uh, uh, storyline and narration, but also in the aesthetic of um, language and language approach. So uh, while um, Byron used um, this very uh, romantic line and romanticizing, mythologizing Mazepa. Uh, Pushkin takes rather a classicist uh, approach uh, in his poem, and also both of them, for example, they um, they pick up uh, completely different um, parts of Mazepa's life uh, in in Byron's text. Uh, uh, it's the story from his youth, uh, and in in Pushkin's. Um, the story related to his elderly uh, age. Uh, so uh, that was really hard uh, to compare and uh, build the structure out of it for uh, the future performer, uh, performers, which uh, the rappers, the rap uh, artists could, um, could use and, and develop. Uh, <coughs> in 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 their performance uh, and and this stage uh, we met um, with Suzanne um, to talk about it and uh, started to work on such uh, structure. So of course, what you see in the video, it's um, 
it's lyrics uh, written by the performers, it's their reflections, um, uh, but it is based uh, on the structure we build and uh, discussed with them uh, d during our workshop. Maybe just to add a little bit more on, on just to, to convey on how it worked technically. So we really, we made like a kind of synopsis, a table where we had fragments from Byron's poem and on the other hand uh, fragments uh, by uh, Pushkin and we tried, well it's not really an option to find matching fragments or ma matching passages because as Mikola just said, the poems are so very different. But nevertheless it is an option to identify certain topics, uh, like topics of uh, sexualized politics, topics of sexualized landscapes, um, uh, topics of ageism, for example, um, topics on, on certain ideas of how, how the historical events unfolded, even though Byron does almost not make any comment on, on the historical background. Um, and so we, we tried to, um, to make this topical structure, so to speak, and identified, I guess it was, believe it was about six or seven topics or so. And then in the next step, um, when kind of Mikola figured out that he wanted to do these two battles with three rounds each, we tried to uh, adjust this structure to the structure of the battle that was going to be filmed and try to find these so six um, six topics or six three themes that each round could evolve so that each round could evolve around a different or a new theme or topic even though of course there is a certain overlap between um, these uh, topics and then in the workshop is that too long? Am I talking? No, no, it's fine. And then, and and then in the workshop, it, it was. Um, I mean, it was uh, extremely interesting. They had the entire poems before, and also I believe Mikola, you sent them also our synopsis that we prepared for them. And we also, um, I should add, uh, we also wrote brief introductory notes to these fragments, because it's difficult to understand them without any background knowledge. Um, yeah, so we, we kind of tried to walk through these uh, through this synopsis. It was not really an option to do a well. A, I'm saying this as a literary scholar to do a proper close reading, maybe. Uh, but but nevertheless, um, I mean, the the most important part to getting an understanding of the rapper's reading of these poems. Um, because it's what, it wasn't about them to, to represent either Byron or Pushkin. It, it wasn't about them to impersonate one of them. It wasn't about them to give a kind of uh, a proper interpretation of one of these, um, or a scholarly interpretation. It was about a process of translation, as you, I think, uh, correctly said, uh, of culture and translation, of time translation. Um, of course, of um, verbal translation, of genre translation, after all, from the poem to, to, to a rap battle. And uh, so it was a couple of very, very intense days where, um, f like, we first dug into the original material to then just distance ourselves from that and, and uh, uh, the rappers starting writing their own lines, sometimes picking up a line maybe from the poems, um, but mostly through various stages of revision and even rehearsal, uh, coming up um, with something that then changed again during the filming process. Okay, yeah, that's very, very complex. But that brings me to this idea that it's not just about translation, but there is something also going on, a very complicated uh, dynamics um, whereby you have different, and you, you mentioned uh, in our conversation prior to this talk that there are four kinds of lang English language uh, uh, that, uh, that you can hear, and uh, it's people from 
they speak di English differently and they're from different contexts. And yet they kind of represent another layer of, if you will, Western, uh, Western uh, culture, right? Uh, um, at the same time, yeah, I want to, because it's a work of deconstructing the imperialist narrative and 19th century literature is essentially, especially if you talk about Pushkin, uh, but Byron for English literature is similarly a very important national poet. So this poetry is uh, an essential, is connected to the construction of nation state and nationalism and uh, promoting um, and constructing um, specific narratives about history, promoting that uh, state uh, in, in, in case of Pushkin, Spaltava. Uh, by the way, it's very curious that, I don't know what, what, what is going on now, I imagine it's a perfect poem to be mobilized again uh, for a semi-fascist state that it is now, right? It's full of, uh, full of exaggerated, uh, yeah, sexualized images uh, of uh, violence. Uh, it pushes particular narrative of expansion, of victory of Peter uh, the first, not only over Mazepa, right, but also over the Swedish kingdom. And it's this kind of battle of West and East going on uh, in, in the poem. And on, and on the level of performance and on the level of project as such, there is also that this story is told by, you know, English speaking uh, performers which I found very interesting that the choice of language is not Ukrainian or Russian or any other uh, language, but English, which displaces discussion and which uh, kind of is told through their perspective. And uh, yeah, I, I just, I don't know, I want to hear your thoughts about this particular also perspective and the West East uh, dynamic and where Ukraine uh, is actually placed. It is as if, again, Ukraine is squashed by these two big, uh, you know, uh, big poets and big, uh, again, Pushkin on one hand and Byron on the other hand. So how have, how you then was working through, through that uh, and uh, yeah, the the language uh, question is actually very important because uh, during the process of development of this project, I uh, had the different visions uh, of um, uh, which language um, should be used uh, in this work. Uh, so um, before the final version, which is English, uh, there was other options. I was thinking. Um, to base everything on the language of the original texts, which is uh, English in case of Byron and Russian in case of Pushkin. But then I thought that that would create a very strange uh, projection to what is happening today and uh, uh, would sneak too much to uh, some kind of uh, a Cold War discourse or uh, uh, like a very... Um, black and white uh, vision of the battle of the west and east uh, if you like so uh, <coughs> i refused uh, uh, that option uh, then i start to think uh, mm, more from uh, mm, ukrainian uh, ukraine oriented uh, perspective and i thought that uh, what if uh, uh, we just use uh, mm, translation of uh, both of these texts uh, to Ukrainian and have uh, two Ukrainian speaking rec rappers. Um, but then uh, ag again it was the question of accessibility uh, by other people who don't speak Ukrainian uh, and uh, especially in a case with the work which is based on text and based on a rap which is a very fast type of expression of the text. No one will understand anything, like uh, the, the, the subtitles would be too fast uh, in the end. Um, uh, but but still um, um, uh, still it's it's related to the problem uh, which is uh, I think in, in the end it is in the work uh, that um, Mazepa is shaped uh, 
by two gazes, uh, which are not Ukrainian gazes. Uh, it's a foreign gazes, uh, and uh, one uh, the gaze is, let's say, um, very imperialistic uh, and uh, political and even propagandist uh, in this sense. Uh, which is Pushkin case. Uh, another one from Byron is also uh, transforming a real person um, to some kind of a, a mythological uh, creature, a strange mix uh, of a man <laughs> and a horse, uh, and uh, um, which uh, um, which is beautiful in the uh, in his text uh, from the poetic perspective, uh, but more related to the author's uh, fantasies uh, than uh, uh, than to reality. So, um <clears throat> yeah, so in the end, uh, the decision was made uh, to use English uh, for a few reasons. Uh, mm, uh, first, of course, the reason of accessibility uh, of a larger audience uh, to this work. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, there are four performers uh, in this um, in this work, and um, all through all of them use English language. I think uh, we can speak about four different English here, because uh, it sounds different, um, and it represents uh, different perspectives, uh, uh, because also all the performers are people with different um, national uh, background. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. I, I also think that this is a, one of the crucial questions of the project, the kind of the language question. And I, f first of all, I, I would assume that uh, translating or using English in this project is not about like regarding English as a global language that we all happily share and like uh, communicate communicate without any obstacles. Um, of course. Um, English is also a colonial language. <laughs> I guess um, uh, there is a, a rather developed consciousness for, for, for this uh, right now, that it's not a kind of uh, neutral, globish, um, omni, uh, esperanto, or, or so to speak. Um, and, then, um, and then I guess w what's important here is that uh, we have and translation process going on. And translation is not about making things familiar. Any translation process is about estranging things. Any translation is a kind of attempt to allegedly say the, the same thing in different words. So any translation uses different words. And this project is very much about trying to find different words or a different mode of expression through translation, through medial translation, translation sh through verbal translation, sh through any kind of translational processes. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I would just like to stress that, that English is here not about to, uh, to, to assume a kind of uh, community language or so, so to say, speak, but rather to stress maybe the tensions and the differences and the background that each of these rappers bringing to the performance. Thank you. Do you want to, to add anything on the question of, I'm, I'm curious to hear maybe another round if, 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 you, if you want to conclude before asking audience if, if there are any questions actually. Because we can go on and on if there yeah, are. Maybe I'd uh, add uh, something yeah. to like continue your continue questions. this talk about language. Um, <coughs> uh, also, another thing which is important is that, uh, of course, this work is planned to be shown uh, uh, in different places, uh, but. Um, it is commissioned and uh, um, the sh uh, are showing for the first time uh, here uh, in Britain. So this is why uh, the English um, language um, uh, also important uh, in this sense. But uh, um, also this moment that um, uh, 
the 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 problem which uh, one of the problems which this work is picking up is that uh, there is a t talk about Ukraine um, and um, Mazepa is a symbol of Ukraine in this work if you like um, uh, often happening without um, participation of Ukraine uh, which I, I think not how uh, how it should be uh, so. Uh, uh, another important message uh, um, implemented I in this work is this uh, uh, de decolonial uh, um, aspect uh, to uh, to create a different uh, perspective on uh, Pushkin's approach, uh, but also to Byron's approach, because Byron was a representative of another empire, which was the Brit uh, British Empire. Yeah, that's very, very important. Yeah, yeah I uh, think it, and, and that's why I think this very place is so <laughs> apt for, for having this premiere because the Pushkin House London is just the place where Pushkin's imperialism and Byron's colonialism or Orientalism, in fact, um, just collide and clash, yeah. Uh, and in, in this sense, I think uh, uh, this is also a very right uh, place to start this discussion because uh, uh, there are different opinions about it and uh, some of my Ukrainian friends, for example, were, uh, they are really triggered by, by the name of Pushkin uh, and also the Pushkin house uh, uh, called after Pushkin's name. Um, but I don't think uh, it should uh, stop us uh, to uh, to to run this discussion because I don't think it's uh, it's the right idea to uh, to just cancel things or to ban them or to ignore them as uh, you know there is this aim to <coughs> cancel Russian culture as such. I don't think uh, that. Uh, um, the perspective uh, mm, and self-perspective of Russian culture will change in this way because it can change only through discussion. Yeah, I would totally agree and I w would like to say something about the question of canon and epistemology but we can have this discussion afterwards if, if there are any immediate questions from the audience um, I would rather give a floor to them. Yes. Hi, I'm Natasha Vulyova, um, Associate Professor in Russian at Birmingham. Um, nice to see you here. Um, um, this is a brilliant project, really interesting. But I was thinking, because I'm also interested in issues of translation and um, and um, interpretation and so on and so on. Um, so what you were saying about the use of rappers and how the rappers created their own texts. So have their texts, when you watched them perform, when you showed the film to you know, your Ukrainian friends, um, have their versions of Mazepa, their interpretations of Mazepa, have they affected your view of Mazepa? Have, they, have there been any sort of you know, ha has it, has it um, inspired you to um, think of Mazepa differently? Because every new text, every translation is a new text, right? And, uh, and it's an independent text. Uh, it's not just an interpretation of Pushkin or Byron. It's a, it's a new text, a new film, and, and each, and they're wonderful. Um, so that's my question. Um. I would not say uh, that the performers uh, performance uh, changed my vision of Mazepa also because um, it was directed by me so <laughs> you know in this sense uh, of course like the uh, what we see is the reflection of the performers uh, but also it's the reflections which were uh, um, directed so uh, the certain structure with um, uh, six rounds and each round uh, has its own topical or thematic line uh, was proposed to them so that was the basis uh, to build the, those reflections um, yeah but I hope that um, <laughs> that, that that will help um, uh, to the audience 
to, cha uh, to change the perspective. Um, and maybe I also can briefly mention um, that um, uh, I often uh, search for inspiration uh, in cinema and films. And uh, if we look at this work also as a film or f like f film based or as a media um, or video based work, uh, there was quite, uh, quite a few films done uh, before. Uh, and so <laughs> also <laughs> one of the reasons why I decided to make this work that each film I've seen before I found quite um, problematic. Uh, in a way how it's showing Mazepa, uh, starting from um, <coughs> the only Ukrainian biopic uh, which is exist uh, to uh, French version of this story, uh, um, uh, German and Russian. Okay. No, no, there is one Ukrainian biopic uh, and it's, it's, quite, it's called uh, uh, The Prey uh, for Hetman Mazepa uh, by uh, Mikhail Ilyenko. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting film because it's a very uh, surreal uh, and also like semi fairy tale approach he used. But at the same time, this film has a, a big uh, mm, political and ethical problems uh, mm, like nationalism or misogyny. Um, so, yeah. Um, maybe if people are still gathering their questions, I will follow up um, and... Uh, yeah. could I also? Yeah. Maybe could I also react to, to, to this question? Because for me, it has definitely enriched my perspective on the entire topic. I mean, let alone watching these rappers enact voices of Byron or Pushkin, speaking kind of on behalf uh, of them and offering their perspective on, 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 on Mazeppa. Um, yeah, so Jamaican-born female rappers um, enacting Byron's Mazeppa, of or, or Ellie from London speaking of Mazeppa and comparing kind of Mazeppa and, and Motria to Romeo and Juliet. I mean, I wouldn't, it's not that I would maybe share this comparison or, or intend to pursue it, but nevertheless, it is a very clear example of, first of all, how evasive Mazeppa as a figure is, how fraught he is, and um, how this process of symbolic appropriation evolves. Um, so for me, definitely, this entire project has made, I mean, I'm not sure if I call, could call it a texture, but has definitely enriched the entire texture of my perception of Mazepa, yeah. We do yeah. have a question uh, online. Uh, what is the significance of the font used in the film? Is there any particular reason for your choice? Interesting question. Um, well, <coughs> talking about the font, um, font and titles, I think, uh, is a very uh, important element uh, of any film. If you look precisely to, to a, almost any film, uh, any feature, uh, you will see that uh, um, it's like um, acting or like a score or music in the film. So uh, it's the same, uh, has the same significance and importance. And usually there are a lot of craft uh, invested uh, into this part. And uh, I usually work um, with one and the same um, artist um, uh, to create titles for not only for this film, but also for my previous film. Uh, it's Daniel Rivkovsky uh, mm, from the same city as I am, uh, from Kharkiv in Ukraine. Um, yeah, and uh, here, together with him, uh, uh, we were discussing uh, actually the, uh, the approach, uh, the aesthetic approach for font. And um, we were relying on different uh, types of posters uh, and uh, different visual information uh, representing Mazeppa. So like all the um, posters of a theatrical plays, uh, um, uh, stage plays or uh, uh, films uh, related to Mazeppa. 
and um, it's not re completely repeating uh, one of them, but it's rather the impression of the designer uh, based on that. I shall mention that you can buy Mazepa t-shirts, <laughs> right? Yes, and please can buy Mazepa t-shirt. <laughs> when the money is a special project, or is it some part of? Uh, uh, well, uh, the, the, the merchandise is related. The sale of merchandise related to fundraising campaign. So um, I, I think uh, the half uh, of costs uh, will go. Uh, to donations to help uh, Ukrainian people at war. So you not only will have a nice t-shirt, but it will be for a good cause. Um, um, do we have more questions? Yes, please. First of all, how did you choose the particular wrappers for the project? Um, and secondly, how much agency did they have? Because it struck me in the first battle that one of the rappers was much stronger than the other. I was wondering if there was any directorial control over that, or that was just how it was. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I worked with, uh, with the film production, uh, Cartago Film, um, which is... Um, um, people um, based and working in Berlin and uh, they also have uh, um, the casting producer so uh, we organized the casting call uh, for rappers and uh, first the idea was to bring people <coughs> to invite people from Berlin but then somehow <laughs> it grow <laughs> to the international level and in the end uh, they are from different countries um, yeah, so they were uh, selected through the casting procedure. There was uh, many applications. Uh, mm, th then I selected a short list uh, and then the, the final list of the participants. And uh, uh, one thing which was important is this creation of these pairs. So uh, that was uh, intentional that it should be people of different gender and a different race and w with a different no national background. Um, but also uh, a different approach in, uh, in rap or um, like their artistic expression because they are not, uh, uh, not all of them like solid hip hop uh, artists but uh, some of them more related to the hip hop scene uh, like Cassian uh, uh, some more like uh, to spoken word performance uh, performers and writing uh, like um, Ellie um, and uh, this certain disbalance uh, you mentioned that one could look uh, stronger than another uh, that is, I think, uh, because of the clash of this. I don't think that um, uh, someone is weaker <laughs> and someone is, is uh, stronger, but it's just uh, different approaches in, in, in the spoken word expression. Sorry. You got it? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a quick question. So. If I understand, so you, um, maybe I haven't understood, but you prepared, so you wrote pieces, or did, they, did you devise it, or was it devised, or they just each went on their sides and then they wrote their ideas, they came back with, with the text. And also, the, I noticed a moment with a bit of improv as well, so was it, on the day you shot the movie, was it some improv rela uh, interactions with the audience around, with the teams, when they shout, glory, glory, uh, and tema and tema. So was it improvised or was it mixed? Or yeah. Um, so um, of course it was sh it was filmed uh, uh, as a live performer performer performance, uh, uh, just uh, not made for public, but for the camera eye. Um, but a part of it, of, uh, of course, has uh, stage, staged elements, right? Uh, because also um, you might mention the images uh, which are appearing uh, in the film and also which are made in the form of uh, posters uh, or um, different kind of uh, uh, 
um, prints um, referring to to the image images which uh, people would um, take for manifestation for example because some of them on stick and uh, so that was a reference in my mind uh, for that but uh, uh, the images are also um, important because they illustrate uh, the story or um, help to navigate the viewer uh, in the story and um, yeah I actually was quite amazed uh, how performers uh, worked uh, with the audience because uh, um, I was thinking about this interaction as a director uh, and imagining that I would need to direct it but actually um, uh, they played a big role in this themselves so uh, they navigated uh, the people around um, how to react uh, and uh, how to interact. Okay, um, more questions? Yeah, Michal. Um, yeah, just, um, uh, oops, does this work? Yeah, I, I suppose it kind of maybe um, uh, slightly, uh, well, maybe it's an epistemological question and institutional question as well. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, Pushkin as a name is, and Pushkin House, the institution too, is triggering in some way for many of your Ukrainian uh, colleagues. And so we've talked about deconstructing the, the canon of the two poets, in a way. Um, what feelings do you, not just you, Mikola, but all three of you have about being in this institution with this name at this time? Um, is, is it enough in, in terms of a process of this deconstruction for the institution to engage with critical and with, um, or is it, is it intellectually and, and politically rewarding for this kind of engagement to happen or actually does the canon need to be con deconstructed to the extent that this, this, uh, this triggering name is um, decapitated? Okay, shall I start? Well, my first association with Pushkinsky Dom is of, uh, with Pushkin House is, of course, the Petersburg Pushkinsky Dom as as a scholarly research institution, one of that has really <laughs> has done a great deal of work to canonize Pushkin as a figure and as a um, father figure of, of Russian literature, as the founder of the Zolotoy Fund. Um, but as I said previously, to me, first of all, um, this institution bearing this name is a kind of, um, is the place to enact and to stage and to have this encounter between Pushkin and Byron to happen and to unfold uh, in order to really I'm not sure if it's deconstruction. I'm, I'm rather, I, I should say, I'm, 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 I'm a bit precarious about using this term, deconstruction. But um, about s starting, yeah, something that is a reflection and refraction, maybe, um, of, of the canon, which is not done through just relabeling or renaming, or um, maybe a London Pushkina part. Um, but that should, um, yeah, first of all, get to maybe to the origins of um, why it's a Pushkin house. And so and the origin is the text. We should work with the text. In, um, and I'm not sure that this house would be served in, in, in just in, in getting a new name, but it should work with its legacy. And to me, this project is part of kind of thinking through this legacy. Yeah, can I add something? Um, I tend to agree with what you said, but if personally, how do I feel? Well, how do I feel carry Russian passport in my pocket? How do I feel? Uh, you know, there are many, many feelings one can have. And I agree that renaming something is not going to save you from that baggage that, that you carry. 
Um, that's why, um, yeah, it would be nice that suddenly you've been pushing house for a number of decades and now you, I don't know, you're something else you, and you pretend uh, <laughs> that this did not exist. I think, unfortunately, you have to work this through. But I want to say something, yeah, because that, that's more difficult and that's more brave because you, you will have to, and then eventually that name may change, but in, in the process of, of, of that work. But I want to say something also about the context in which the house exists, right? It's not, has nothing to deal with Russian government. It exists and situates in British context where is also uh, linked to white immigration uh, a, a lot and all uh, Slavonic studies and Russian studies, you know, we all work in those departments, they bear the legacies of Cold War and also specific narrative about this great Russian literature as against uh, revolution, so socialist, uh, you know, legacies of 20th century. So there are a lot, and within socialism, as we know itself, that period is also a lot of problems with uh, with the canon and imperialism and, uh, and all of that. But in Britain, we pretty much in that, uh, in many uh, cases, in the context where we are dealing, in my view, with that Cold War legacies where it was very cool uh, up until recently to teach right-wing uh, philosophers in British universities like Eileen, you know, proto-fascist uh, Hege Hegelian philosopher who's like P Putin reads, for example, and it's completely bizarre philosophically as a philosopher I can say that there are many problems, right? Or to teach Dostoevsky without mentioning his anti-Semitism. So there is like a lot of work to be done. And I think it's a good to start this conversation because uh, it just didn't happen yet, unlike in English literature studies, for example, and we had post-colonial theory from India in 60s, 70s, all the debates, right? So I think this is very important, so I agree that it's rather um, good to actually have this conversation and it's going to be difficult and painful, but we have to work this through, in my opinion. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, <coughs> um, there is this work, right? Uh, and uh, this work is going to be shown in different places. But uh, also, um, the place where it's shown brings uh, something else, brings um, another dimension or aspect to the work, right? So it's it's a different thing if that would be shown in some let's say neutral, if there are neutral places at all, uh, European Museum or Kunsthalle, or if that could be shown, uh, let's say, in uh, uh, where? Goethe Institute, or uh, another context would be if that would be shown in um, National Pavilion of Ukraine at Venice Biennale, right? Completely different uh, context. Uh, and then Pushkin House is another one. So I think that uh, <coughs> in this case also the project uh, start to have this element of uh, institutional critique, uh, which I think very important. Uh, but what is also important that these kind of things are uh, also seen uh, differently from different places. So. Um, the perspective of some of my Ukrainian friends uh, is different as it's seen from Ukraine. So, uh, for example, uh, some people think that this is Russian institution. We understand that this is actually not. <laughs> it's a British uh, institution dealing with uh, um, studies of, um, of, a, of a, a Russian culture. But, um, um, of course, um, uh, what is important, and I think it's one of the goals of Mazepa project, uh, is uh, is is bring this uh, <coughs> decolonial message to to change this approach, uh, and first of all uh, to British audience. But may, may, maybe I can. So we make a second round, a second round of. <laughs> but of course you're right. I mean. I guess the question is, what's in a name here? 
and uh, <laughs> I, I've guess, I've ge I guess you've had this discussion, or maybe it's an ongoing discussion, and it's not so easy to reclaim a name uh, with all the symbolic baggage that it comes with. And um, um, so um, maybe this is, um, I, I, I don't think that this project that we've discussed today is a project that allows for a reclaiming of Pushkin. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely the Pushkin House would need an answer as to why it's sticking with its name, um, not using it as a, as a neutral label, uh, but nevertheless as, as something that it identifies with this. With it. Okay, so I, I will continue. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know that uh, I also, as Ukrainian, I have this um, uh, experience um, <coughs> of uh, living with um, uh, decommunization uh, protests uh, happened in Ukraine recently when uh, just many uh, um, uh, streets were renamed, uh, some monuments were erased and destroyed, so I would say that was quite a radical uh, approach to do that in Ukraine. And uh, probably some things need to be radically changed, uh, but some not, and some should be just provided um, with a critical commentary. Uh, and um, uh, to to create this new uh, new vision and a new perspective. Uh, so maybe this is my answer that uh, um, some things uh, should not be uh, changed on the level of the facade, on the level of the cover or name, but the perspective how we look at it and the uh, our attitude. Um, should change and it should be different through the uh, critical uh, commentary possibly okay thank you thank you so much i think we need to conclude now um is there any last very short question no okay that's great we can continue <laughs> outside uh, thank you so much for coming uh, and thank you both for conversation and I think it was um, amazing to hear um, what you think on all these complex issues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Well, i just like to thank you for this very important discussion and for these very important conversations that, is, that are happening here. And in response to the name, obviously we're thinking about it uh, on the daily basis and what it represents. But we do feel that there comes a certain responsibility with bearing the name, and especially during the war. And, um, uh, and uh, as, I, as I've said before, it's very easy to change the facade but actually what's happening behind and the work that is happening behind, um, which allows us, which is painful work, as Masha said, and which allows us to kind of, uh, to come closer to the vision of Pushkin House, but also brings all these sort of limitations and frustrations with it, which we have to acknowledge, and also understanding kind of our ignorances. But this is a work in progress, so thank you very much for this. Thanks. Thank you.